Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'm anxious to conclude the week with more reading and discussion of this book, Rome and Civil Liberty by James A. Wiley. This is the hostile takeover of Great Britain, an attempt by the Vatican to impose in Great Britain Roman Catholic canon law. And why? Because Roman Catholic canon law demands that the Pope be worshipped as God on earth. That's the whole object of this papal aggression we see in 1865 in Great Britain. Now, what about canon law? What consequence would it have for Great Britain? James A. Wiley, in the last full paragraph on page 77, says, What then does canon law mean? as applied to Great Britain. It means in the first place the transference of the sovereignty of Britain from Queen Victoria to the Roman Pontiff. It means in the second place that the right of Parliament to legislate unless in complete subserviency to every requirement of canon law shall cease and determine or cease and desist. It means that priests shall not be amenable to the civil tribunals, okay, immune from the civil law and the civil courts, and that when accused of treason or of murder or of any crime whatever, and I will include including sodomy of little boys, the ecclesiastical courts only shall have power to try them. That is, the church courts, those who are overseen by the Pope, They are the only courts that shall have any jurisdiction over these priests. It means that the Pope shall be entitled to appoint to every ecclesiastical living in the country the right of investiture. He picks every priest, every pastor, every church official. And it says it means the restoration of church lands, A, to the very last acre. Okay, that all the lands that were lost at the time of the Protestant Reformation and King Henry VIII would re- be restored to the papacy and would serve the papacy and not Great Britain. Now listen carefully. Here's what it means that really touches you and me. It means that Protestantism is punishable with confiscation of goods, with imprisonment, And finally, with death at the hands of the civil magistrate. Okay? We become an enemy of the state. Protestants become the enemy of the state under Roman Catholic canon law. And it says that every suspected man, that anyone who is suspected of Protestantism, shall purge himself. Okay? Shall shall renege his Protestantism. He shall purge himself to the satisfaction of a severe and vigilant tribunal, or die by fire. In other words, he will be subject to the Inquisition, because it was the holy office of the Inquisition, such as now called the Congregation for the Preservation of the Doctrine of the Faith, is the one who tries heretics, And their object is to get them to recant and to come into full fellowship with the the Roman pontiff and Roman Catholic canon law and the Roman Catholic Church or die by fire. That's exactly what James A. Wiley is predicting for England if it doesn't soon wake up. Now he says it means that those who die not in communion with the Roman Catholic Church shall not have Christian burial. 
okay, after I die, I don't care what they do with my body. But Rome goes so far as to deny Protestants burial. That means their bodies are literally thrown in the ditch for dogs to consume. Okay, they may be buried secretly at night by friends or family, but there'll be no official burial. And if the body remains under the control of the Church of Rome, say after an execution in the Inquisition, the body is literally desecrated by whatever means. That's the history of the Roman Catholic Church. That's what we can expect under Roman Catholic canon law. Now, canon law then, though based on a great religious dogma, namely the vicarship of the Roman pontiff, is mainly a civil and political code. The prerogatives it claims are of a civil and temporal kind, namely supreme jurisdiction over every person and land. The punishments it inflicts are of a temporal sort, confiscation of goods, banishment, imprisonment, and death. We hold, then, and we challenge any Romanist to disprove our position, and I might add, including my Roman Catholic critic, who writes me from time to time, he says, we hold then and we challenge any Roman Catholic to disprove our position that any society formed on such a basis, that is Roman Catholic canon law, and governed by such a code is not a religious but a political association. And that the man who attempts to introduce such a law into Britain, and uh, you might add America, throws down the gauntlet to the queen. Now this is where James A. Wiley stops, but it is to throw down the gauntlet to the creator. It is the papacy who asserts and usurps God's rightful throne. It is God who is being sinned against in the, in the establishment of Roman Catholic canon law in any land. It is God's throne that is challenged. Not just the Queen of Great Britain, not just the Presidency of the United States, not just the Constitution, but the Bible and Jesus Christ. The papacy is first and foremost an assault upon the throne of Almighty God. Now, to get people's attention, you might use the threat against the government, the, the threat against the sovereignty of the nation, and the threat against your liberties. But it goes far, far beyond that. The establishment of Roman Catholic canon law literally eliminates God's holy, eternal, and immutable law. It removes God from society and replaces him with the papacy. You see why Rome so much desires for Roman Catholic canon law to be the law of every land, including the whole world? He says, we hold then, and we challenge any Romanist to disprove our position, that any society formed on such a basis and governed by such a code is not a religious, but a political association, and that the man who attempts to introduce such a law into Great Britain throws down the gauntlet to the queen. He, in fact, engages in an open attempt to overthrow the constitution of the country and to abrogate all laws, all rights, and all privileges which do not emanate from canon law. We maintain that the papal aggression as much contemplates the overthrow of our Constitution and the subversion of all of our liberties as if the standard of open revolt were unfurled and arms and armies raised to effect the enterprise. Every man, James A. Wiley has just called what the papacy is doing in Britain at that time an open declaration of war. And that's exactly what it is in the United States today. Only no one is sounding the warning. And Rome's enemies, Protestantism, 
the Bible and Jesus Christ are all, from her point of view, slumbering, not even twitching in response to the de declaration of war. He says, every man who puts himself under canon law deserts his queen, throws off the authority of British law, and places himself, body and soul, under a foreign dominion. Every Briton becomes a subject of a foreign king. Foreign, not only to Britain, but foreign to the whole world. Because Christ created this world. And the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, is foreign to it. Now, such is the constitutional aspect of this question. It is not a question of church or a question of creed, but it is a question, first of all, of national independence. It is a trial of strength between the queen and the pontiff, which shall govern the realm of England. And no one can make a concession to the pope without becoming a traitor to the queen. We are aware that in this light, our statesmen have not been brought to view it. Else surely they would not help forward this rebellion. They persist in looking at the matter simply as a religious controversy. Their mistake, however, cannot alter the nature of the case, which indisputably is an attempt, the, most, the more dangerous since it is covered by religious disguises, on the part of a foreign power to obtain supreme civil and spiritual jurisdiction within the realm. Every favor conferred upon the Roman Catholic priesthood, every penny given to the Roman Catholic University at Maynooth is a contribution on the part of the nation to help to overthrow itself. Some few shreds of British law might remain, such as did, uh, such as did not come into co collision with the inexorable claims of canon law, but they would be utterly worthless as a defense of our liberties. Every jot and every tittle of British law not in harmony with the ghostly enactments of canon law would be, ipso facto, canceled. And our noble code would become a poor, shriveled, palsied thing without life or vigor. Even if the form of constitutional government were suffered to exist, and Parliament allowed to assemble, its legislative functions would be reduced to a dead letter. It could not legislate about a college or a school or a convent. It could not make laws about a new book or extend a new privilege to the subject or impose a new tax or make a railroad or form a treaty with a foreign government without being told that in every one of these matters, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, had an interest, and that Parliament must guide itself by canon law. In other words, surrender the whole legislative powers of the country into the hands of the Roman Catholic Church. Every social as well as every political right would come to be re regulated by Roman Catholic canon law. Our right to educate our families, our right to trade, our right to trade, <clears throat> our right to speak, to publish, to read, our right to marry, our right to be buried, would all be regulated by Roman Catholic canon law. That is, they would be swept away altogether. To all this extent, have we seen the Pope attempting to interfere in Piedmont? Okay? James A. Wiley is saying, if you want to see what's going to happen in Great Britain when Roman Catholic canon law is established as the law of the land, then all you have to do is look at Piedmont. Okay? Piedmont is where the papacy for centuries pursued the annihilation, the extinction of the entire Waldensian community. For centuries pursued them. 
And we read the book here on Inquisition Update, uh, the, the Israel of the Alps and the History of the Waldenses by James A. Wiley. All you have to do is look at the way Rome treated the Waldensians and you know exactly what's going to happen in Great Britain or any other land that falls to Roman Catholic canon law. He says, to all this extent have we seen the Pope attempting to interfere in Piedmont and to all this extent do the concordats framed in Spain, Portugal, and the continental states go. Those who think that the triumph of Romanism will bring it only a few slight changes on the surface of society simply labor under a hallucination. No, it will lay the axe to the root of the British Constitution and that noble tree which shelters alike the queen and the peasant, the noble of Britain and the ancestral hall, and the poor Indian on the banks of the Ganges will fall, and at the sound of its fall, the earth will shake. So in this last phrase, he's simply acknowledging that canon law is destined to become global law. That's the new world order. The world has fallen to Antichrist. Not just the United States, not just Britain, the whole world. The European Union and the whole world. Uh, the next portion of the book is entitled The Subjects of the New Kingdom. The Subjects of the New Kingdom. This, says, says James A. Wiley, it may be said, is mere abstract law. Stringent as its enactments may be, and treasonable as its object undoubtedly is, unless it has some way of embodying itself in fact, it cannot danger the rule of the queen or destroy the unity of the nation. So far, true. But we ought to bear in mind that there is daily growing up in the midst of us a concrete body from whom this law receives unquestioning and implicit obedience. In ordinary cases, the kingdom comes first and the law afterwards. For the law is made for the subjects and not the subjects for the law. But this, which is the natural and usual order, has been reversed in this case, the case of which we are speaking. In other words, Roman Catholic canon law. First came the law, and that law created subjects for itself. That's what Roman Catholic canon law does. The law does not serve the people. The law of the Roman Catholic Church exists and thereby creates its own subjects. Okay, this order obtained not in the most absolute sense, for even before the, the arrival of the Cardinal from the Flaminian Gate, nay, even before the Emancipation Act of 1829, there was a considerable body of Romanists in the kingdom who furnished standing ground to canon law and were made the fulcrum on which the lever of the papal aggression was rested. Okay? It could not have happened. None of it could have happened were England free of Roman Catholics. Roman, ca <coughs> excuse me, Roman Catholics in the land is the very seed from which canon law grows. Roman Catholics in every land form the excuse the papacy needs to govern his people and govern them completely through Roman Catholic canon law. And once the people of the Roman Catholic Church succumb to Roman Catholic canon law, then the, foot, then the, then the papacy has a foothold in the nation and then uses that foothold to get a complete hold that's the entire history of Romanism. It's happening in Great Britain at the time of the writing of this book. It's happening in the United States today.
what do we think of Roman Catholics in this country? Are they equal citizens in the United States? Is their allegiance truly for our country, our constitution, our way of life? Or they are, are they a new creature, a different sort of citizen whose allegiance is to Rome and the Roman pontiff? How can they be called citizens of the United States? This is the very same question James A. Wiley is asking of Britons. How can you value your constitution, your rights, your form of government, your way of life, if you're constantly yearning to be controlled by a foreign potentate from a foreign land and who promotes a foreign law? And I will add, finally, a foreign God. James A. Wiley continues, but latterly this body, <clears throat> the body of Roman Catholics within Great Britain, has been rapidly increasing in number and in strength. This is, the, this is to be ascribed to the variety of causes, to a variety of causes, to Anglo-Catholic perversions, remember we talked about that earlier in the book, where Protestantism was being Catholicized in the universities and seminaries. They were trying to teach transubstantiation. They were trying to teach, once again, that communion was a sacrifice, another sacrifice of Christ's body. That was called Anglo-Catholic, the High Church. It was an attempt to destroy Protestantism. It was part of the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation. And it gained, it gained adherence. Okay, that just set, simply set the stage for this, event, this eventual papal aggression against the government of Great Britain. It started in the colleges and the universities and the seminaries. Okay, we're, we're referring now to Tractarianism, where these universities and colleges saturated England with little tracts that didn't teach the gospel, it Catholicized the minds of the people, dabbling little by little into Roman Catholicism. That's how the papacy and the Jesuits seeded Great Britain with a cancer that would metastasize to the point where the Pope was free to take over. It began with a small seed of Roman Catholic citizens, grew and grew and grew and grew until now the whole country is threatened. He says this is to be ascribed to a variety of causes, to Anglo-Catholic perversions, to the systematic and skillful working of the Romish hierarchy, and last but by no means least, the vast immigration from Ireland. Immigration from Ireland. Now, why is that significant? <clears throat> because Ireland's Roman Catholic. And Rome, the Jesuits, were simply immigrating Roman Catholic Irishmen onto Great Britain, uh, onto England and Scotland to Catholicize those parts of the British Empire that were Protestant. Isn't that exactly what our government's doing by allowing the southern border with Roman Catholic Spanish Mexico, Central and South America, all of it's Roman Catholic. Not a word ever mentioned about that fact in the press. Oh, yes, lots of controversy about the quote-unquote illegal immigrants, but never once are they called Roman Catholic invaders in a papal and a Jesuit-led attack against Protestantism and the Bible and Christ's rightful throne in this country. We don't dare speak in those terms. You see... History is repeating itself. We'll be back right after the message.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to contact me, please do so by email. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. Now, in precise concert with this papal aggression, the establishment of the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the introduction of Roman Catholic canon law into Great Britain, is an invasion of England and, and Scotland by Roman Catholic Irish. It's not a coincidence. 
that they happen in concert. It's planned. It's part of the Jesuit-led uh, counter-reformation. It's Protestantism and the Bible and Christ that's under attack in England. Protestant England. And it's a two-fold attack. Well, multiple folds, but I'll focus on two. The establishment of the Roman Catholic hierarchy, freedom for Roman Catholicism to practice and to prosper, and at the same time, a, a horde of Irish Roman Catholics coming to England to help. That's what's happened. Now look what's happening in the United States. Vatican Council II was the establishment of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country. Oh yes, it existed prior to that. I don't deny that. But it was given political sway at Vatican Council II. It was given an injection of nitromethane when the Protestants capitulated at Vatican Council II and joined the ecumenical movement to make the Pope the head of Christendom. Now we've got an unregulated onslaught of Roman Catholics from the southern Americas, Mexico, all the way south, flooding into this country. It's not a coincidence that they happened at the same time. <clears throat> not only are the card-carrying Roman Catholics now been legitimized by Vatican Council II, the ecumenical evangelical bellies that surrendered to the Pope are now being Catholicized. They're becoming Catholic. They're becoming taught Catholic doctrine. It's kind of like the high church in England. It's kind of like Anglo-Catholicism all over again. Futurism. They're taught futurism. The Pope's not the Antichrist. The Antichrist is just sing one single individual that doesn't come until the end of time. We don't have to worry about him now. The Pope is the leader of the Christian world. And at the same time, Catholics are flooding into the southern states and spreading all over this country, especially in the power centers where the manufacturing is, where the great populations are, where the, where the power is. And they occupy the voting booth. And they vote Catholic. They're all voting Catholic. The same thing is happening in Great Britain at the time of the writing of this book. He says, this is to be ascribed to a variety of causes, to Anglo-Catholic perversions, to the systematic and skillful working of the Romish hierarchy, and last, but by no means least, to the vast immigration from Ireland. Previous to 1829, Ireland was confined to the western side of St. George's Channel. And all of the popery, well nigh of the British islands, was included betwixt the two points of Giant's Causeway and Cape Clear. But since the period of the Emancipation Act, Ireland has burst her bounds and diffused herself all over Great Britain. Again and again, we have seen the gates of the country suddenly open and its sons issue forth in hundreds of thousands. We have witnessed corresponding transformations as if by enchantment in not a few localities of our own country. An Irish town has risen here, and an Irish parish has emerged there, after the fashion of the house of Our Lady of Loreto, that is, an idol, a Roman Catholic idol that's worshipped by the Irish. He says, after the fashion of the house of Our Lady of Loreto, and it may be by the same agency, whole villages of Irish cabins with all their accompaniments have been, as it were, carried across the wilds of Kerry and the shores of Galway and safely deposited on this side of the channel. Now, he, he mentions the Lady of Loreto, 
what do we see Roman Catholics carrying about in uh, the, the Mexicans flooding into this country? Our Lady of Guadalupe. You see, they're benefiting, so to speak, and they're declaring their motive. They care, the, the Mexicans and South Americans that are flooding into this country through Mexico are carrying banners of Our Lady of Guadalupe. They're making a statement. Mary is leading us. It's a religious invasion. And this is the very point that James A. Wiley is making of these Irish that are flooding into Great Britain. They're carrying the banner of the Lady of Loretto. Mary, the Roman Catholic Mary. It's a religious invasion. It's, a pol it's taking place under political, uh, a, a political objective, but a religious disguise. He says, after the fashion of the house of Our Lady of Loretto, and it may be by the same agency, whole villages of Irish cabins, with all their accompaniments, have seen, as it were, ha have been, rather, as it were, carried across the wilds of Kerry and the shores of Galway and safely deposited on this side of the channel. Why all of a sudden... Irish Roman Catholics carrying banners of Mary flooding into Great Britain. It's an organized effort led by the Counter-Reformation, the Jesuit order. The papacy. It's a multi-front assault against the Bible and Christ in England. He says, this has happened in part, we doubt not, at the wish and by the arrangement of the priesthood. The Jesuit priesthood. But in still greater part, we are persuaded, it has arisen from causes over which the priesthood had no control, and which neither they nor anyone else could have foreseen. But we have to do, not with the cause but with the fact of this extraordinary diffusion of, Ir of the Irish race and of the basis which it furnishes so opportunely for Rome, but so disastrously for us, whereon to rear and to set up a working the machinery of canon law. Okay? Every force has been assembled at precisely the same time to work for the overthrow of Protestantism in Great Britain. <clears throat> now you see, back in 1865, the British could have poo-pooed this idea of James A. Wiley by just simply saying, well, our government needs cheap labor. Britons won't go into the fields and pick the cotton. Britons won't flush, uh, wash, scrub toilets anymore. Britons won't mow the lawn. So we've got to hire cheap labor. We've got to immigrate cheap labor into the country. Nobody had to pick our vegetables. Nobody would pick our potatoes. And so James A. Wiley was probably assaulted with endless excuses not to be concerned about the overwhelming flood of Irish Roman Catholics into Great Britain. <clears throat> I mean, after all, it's going to work in the United States not a hundred years later. You can call it whatever you want. But it's a Jesuit-led, counter-reformation style invasion of this country by Roman Catholic papists who worship and obey the Antichrist of the Bible and wish to usurp the rightful throne of Christ in this country and to destroy Protestantism and to make us all slaves to a man, a sinful, wicked man. 
The object was the same in Great Britain in 1865. It's identical today, even the very methods they use. There's no excuse for anybody in this country to be deceived one whit about what's going on in the United States of America. There's no excuse. The history that we're reading in this book leaves us no excuse to be in question at all about what Rome is doing in this country. They're using the exact same tactics. I mean, it's so obvious it should have been predictable. And yet, there's nothing but naysayers everywhere you go. Oh, Tom, you're just an anti-Roman Catholic bigot. What do you bet you was assault, assaulted by a priest at some time or another? The Pope can't assemble that kind of power. You're telling me that the people coming into this country are to make, Cap make Ro America Roman Catholic? You're out of your mind. Everywhere I go, everybody I talk to, except my listeners, all three of them, you're fortunate, you know, you three that are listening, blessed of God you are. And a mighty commission is upon you to help wake up a slumbering nation. Deceived by every delusion that has come down the pipe. But it's hard to stand before the world and say, you're all wrong and I'm right. It's just too arrogant, just too bold, too brash, too apparently self-serving. Nobody's going to give you credit, but nobody gave Jeremiah credit either. Nor Ezekiel, nor Daniel. And that didn't shut them up, did it? He says, but we have to do, not with the cause, but with the fact of this extraordinary diffusion of the Irish race and the basis which it furnishes so opportunely for Rome, but so disastrous for us, whereon to rear and a set a working the machinery of canon law. Thus a great variety of concurrent causes Famine in Ireland. Remember the potato famine? Oh, that's the excuse they used to explain away the flood of Irishmen coming into Great Britain. There was a potato famine in Ireland. I've heard people suggest that there was plenty of potatoes in Ireland, but that they were exported out of the country, and it was a manufactured potato famine. Now, who would have been in charge of such a thing like that? Well, the trading ships, the trading companies. And who were their owners? The Jesuits. Who simply bought up all the potatoes. I'll bet there were potatoes floating in the channel. And that the Irishmen sailed through those floating potatoes on their way to England. But the deception worked. There's starvation in Ireland, and that's the excuse used to justify so many Roman Catholics, Irish Roman Catholics coming to England. The great variety of concurrent causes all these causes happening at the same time, famine in Ireland, the railway enterprise of Great Britain. Who owned the railways? You really need me to tell you. Improvements in agriculture, the increased demand created thereby for unskilled laborers. There's your, your cheap labor. 
You see history happening all over again? Legislative member, uh, measures all acting together have opened the floodgates of Romanism and brought a deluge over the face of the whole land. No longer is the popery of the British Islands confined as it, were, as it was but a few years ago to one division of our empire, Ireland. Now we behold a systematic and universal distribution of it over the three kingdoms, England, Ireland, and Scotland. It has encompassed our great cities. There its adherents are counted in fifties of thousands. And in some cases, as in the commercial capital of Scotland and the great trading and manufacturing cities of England, they amount to hundreds of thousands. We find the Romanists in considerable force in all of our secondary towns. They form an item, in some instances a large one, in the population of our rural villages and they are scattered by twos and threes of families over many of our rural parishes. These small outlying colonies, individually viewed, are not formidable, but viewed as a part of an organized body which one spirit, which one spirit animates, which one will wields, and which one voice can on emergency bring into action, their importance is great. Why is their importance great? Because they are a unified body, all in perfect harmony with the papacy, and at his whim, they can go into action for the overthrow of the Protestant crown, for the overthrow of the Bible, for the overthrow of Protestantism, and for the ultimate overthrow of Christ himself. He says they swell the numbers and augment the power of the, uh, the aggregate body. Thus do Roman colonies dot our country, affording foothold at every short distance to canon law. Okay? Everywhere a Roman Catholic Irishman resides, there is the Pope's foothold for canon law. Because the Pope, by Roman Catholic canon law, maintains the authority to rule over his people, both spiritually and temporally. Wherever there are Roman Catholics, the Pope is free to govern. First his own people, than everyone else. He says, when we take into account the unchanging character of the church to which this vast body, now distributed amongst us, belongs, the essential antagonism of that church to free institutions, the necessity that it is laid upon her to wear down and ultimately to root out British liberty, when we think of the ignorance and turbulence of the Irish Romanists taking in the mass, the particular mal, uh, mal malignant type of Irish popery, and the use of which the Church of Rome in the past ages has ever found for such mobs, we may well tremble at the danger to which the order and peace of the nation is exposed. As hangs the avalanche on the mountain's brow, or as rested the sword of Damocles above the head of its victim, so hangs this formidable body above the nation. It may not fall immediately, nor for some time to come. It must grow as the avalanche grows. It must rest as the sword of the tyrant rested. And while it is waiting its hour, it will toil in our service, and be to the nation a hewer of wood, a drawer of water. But as certainly as the avalanche descends at last, so swiftly one day will this moral, ab this moral avalanche descend in thundering ruin upon the order, the trade, and the liberty of the United, uh, excuse me, of Great Britain. 
the twisting of my tongue was intentional. It applies ever so much to the United States of America today as it did in Great Britain in 1865. Now he says, is it we only who say so? Do not Romanists themselves proclaim the same thing and openly boast that their adherents are distributed over Britain as soldiers are posted on a battlefield? Isn't that what Francis Rooney in the previous book that we read here on Inquisition Update, the Global Vatican, is not that what he boasted about? It indeed is. He says, is it we only who say so? Do not Romanists themselves, Francis Rooney, proclaim the same thing and openly boast that their adherents are distributed over Britain as soldiers are posted on a battlefield? Don't they run our State Department? Don't they run our foreign policy? Don't they run the CIA, the FBI? Don't they run the Federal Reserve Bank? Don't they run Congress? Don't they run? Don't they own the Supreme Court? The battlefield is from coast to coast and from border to border. And we're in the extreme minority. If you figure the effects of our own Anglo-Catholicism, Vatican Council II, the capitulation of our church's departure from Protestantism to embrace futurism and thereby exonerate the papacy. History has repeated itself. And now Romanists like Francis Rooney are free to boast about their accomplishments. <coughs> and about the need for this country to convert to Roman Catholicism. That was the inherent assertion of Francis Rooney's book. Everything written in that book was to justify the assertion that America, if it's not already Roman Catholic, should convert. We already control the country. Why don't we control your souls, too? James A. Wiley has the same concern. Do not Romanists themselves proclaim the same thing and openly boast that their adherents are distributed over Britain as soldiers are posted on a battlefield? In the November following the papal aggression, Father Ignatius, better known as Reverend Mr. Spencer, perambulated Ireland. He walked all over Ireland, <clears throat> addressing large meetings on the conversion of England, the people pressing about him, eager to kiss the hem of his cloak and share in the virtue of the holy man. Among other inflammatory harangues by which he sought to rouse the hopes and the passions of the Irish Romanists, he was reported as having spoken at Londonderry as follows, quote, He assured his audience in the first place that if Napoleon had had the advantages enjoyed by the present crusader, he would infallibly have invaded and conquered England. For there are 200,000 Irish in London, in a garrison, as it were, impregnable, impregnably entrenched. There are 80,000 in Man Manchester, the same number in Birmingham and in other towns in like proportion. Then in Ireland itself there is the grand army of six million, God's chosen people. If Napoleon had had such forces in his enemies' countries, would he have hesitated for a moment? Certainly not, unquote. And neither did the Pope. 
because England was littered with Roman Catholics, just as the United States is today. It's starting to make sense, isn't it? I'll see you next week. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.